Hello everyone and welcome to part two of our industrial warehouse design video series in which we are going to be talking about conceptual structural design. Now please notice that this video series is a new idea where I have two video series moving in tandem. One of them is being the theoretical video series and one of them is being the practical video series using Autodesk Robot. So you should be looking first on the theoretical video series and then going to the robot uh, video application that is usually uploaded after the theoretical part. So uh, I hope that this new style of video series should be uh, helpful for you because there is so much to unpack in terms of theory and a simple paint as I was doing before will not actually do this topic justice. So today we're going to talk about part two of our multi-parter industrial warehouse design video series. And today we're going to talk about conceptual structural design. Once again, the material is based on the design, single story steel buildings design guide uh, by the steel construction info. This is free to be downloaded. Google it. You will find it very beneficial. Today, we're going to cover portal frames, the preliminary design connections. We're going to skim through very quickly in trusses and simple beams because those topics are a little bit simpler because trusses are things, you know, from preliminary steel courses and then maybe give a take a look on miscellaneous with once again heavy emphasis on the first three points here so with that being said sit back relax and enjoy the show So talking about the types of portal frames you have dual pitch which is basically double pitch meaning that each span pitches on its own. There is, of course, a single pitch warehouse, but that's beyond what we will cover today. You have a curved portal frame. You have a dual portal frame with mezzanine floor. You can use here pre-cast concrete slab if you have stuff above that mezzanine floor. And you have, of course, the dual pitch with a crane, which we've explained before that the crane moves like this. The crane has movement right and left and has a movement perpendicular to the plane, which is back and forth. You could have a duo span, you have a two span duo and a duo with an external office. Of course, those, this one, this one, and this one being the most probable to be seen. Now, the parts of the portal frame are lots. In lecture one of this video series, I talked about how we're going to explain the different parts in the future. So now we are here. Now, first of all, this, this point here is your eaves. Sometimes you call this entire one the eaves height. The roof pitch is the angle at which the roof is pitched. The apex is the highest point in the roof. The rafter is basically the inclined beam. The eaves haunch is this expansion or increase in thickness. We weld something to it to make it a larger uh, beam to resist moments. And you have the apex haunch, the increase in the depth of the beam near the connection. Also you have the column. So those are the parts of the portal frame. Now those parts have typical measurements. <laughs> The span is usually between 15 to 50 meters, so the span here is, we're talking about this distance, so the in-plane span, but you recommend it between 25 and 50, but the typical span is between this and this. Now, why is it recommending those spans? I think I messed up this number, I think it's 35. Check the reference. It's recommending those numbers because it seems to be more economical to do portal frames in those ranges. The eaves height is between 5 and 10 meters with 7.5 recommended. This is controlled by client requirements as well as any crane requirements if you have some. I mean, for example, if you have Airbus hangar, of course, your eaves is going to be much more than 7.5 meters because you are building aircraft here. That's not the case today, uh, but just keep this in mind. Uh, the roof pitch is between 5 and 10 degrees, 6 degrees being common. The frame spacing and this is important, this is the out-of-plane frame spacing, is between 5 meters to 8 meters. Uh, for members, members are usually used to be, like, they are usually selected from beam sections, not from column sections, because, I mean, take a look. Uh, yes, this is called a column, but you are going to select the column shape from the beam shape, because it is going to primarily carry bending. It is not going to carry axial force primarily because that's a single story structure. So the amount of uh, gravity loads you have here are significantly lower than the amount of bending moments you have here. The flexion is here critical. 
especially in the haunch area as well as the apex, uh, the, uh, the eaves area, and haunches need to be provided. Now, what are haunches? Haunches are usually provided for rafters to increase the bending resistance. Haunch at apex is also done for better connections, same section as the rafter, and it's welded to the rafter. I will give more details when we reach the connection details of that structure. Now, this slide might be the most important slide of this video lecture, and I will reference this a lot in my robot video. My robot video is going to be 10 minutes, maybe, or 15 minutes long. With that being said, the haunch size itself, I mean, how long is the haunch? The haunch is 10% of the span. The haunch height is usually the same as the section height because it's taken from this, like, how do they do haunches? They actually cut them from the same section, by the way. So they cut like this, and one piece they take for the left haunch, and the second piece they take for the right haunch. So it's kind of cool what they do. Uh, okay, so usually this configuration will produce negative moments at the haunch edge, similar to positive moments in the mid-span. The haunch edge being here, negative or hogging, and positive or sagging. Now, gable frames exist too. Those are basically portal frames, but special portal frames. The last portal frame in a warehouse is called the gable frame. The reason why this is called like that is because you have different requirements for gable frames. First of all, gable frames are covered by brick wall or cladding. And second of all, you need to apply little frames inside that frame to account for doors and any other access you need to provide. So it's kind of special. So basically, gable frames are special because they provide more functionality than your usual portal frame. All right. So with that being said, you need, of course, to stabilize your portal frame. There is global stability and local stability. The global stability of the structure in plane is achieved due to the frame action and out of plane must be achieved by bracing or even by framing, but bracing is usually the way to go. So this is how you do the global stability. For local stabilization, uh, local stabilization means the stabilization of the sections themselves. Now, for the top side, the outer side, it's assumed to be stable because it's connected to your, to your cladding via the purlins. In the bottom side, it's not stabilized and needs special care by stabilization, stabilization restraints. Those are inclined elements that connect between the lower flange. So this is your beam. Like, to understand this, the beam here is perpendicular to the, to the, to the, to the page. The beam looks like this in 3D. And there is a piece of restraint between the purlin and the beam to stabilize the lower flange. Of course, you would think, wait a minute. Why do I need to stabilize the lower flange? Isn't the moment diagram going to be positive? And positive moment will cause tension on the lower side. I'm afraid of compression, and that's why I stabilize for compression, because of buckling. But do I need to stabilize for tension? Well, the answer is not really, but still look about this. You still have negative moments near the eaves here. So for negative moments, you need to stabilize the lower flange. Another guy would say, okay, fine, let's save some money and not stabilize anything here for the lower flange and only stabilize the lower flange near the eaves. Well, no, it doesn't work because you have something called the uplift lo load case. In the uplift load case, you're only, you, you basically have suction loads on the warehouse, which could, in fact, flip your room diagram upside down and would cause compression on the lower flange. Now, this must be extreme. This is an extreme case, but, well, we've seen hurricanes before, so this might happen. Uh, another thing that we want to say about the global stabilization is that stabilizing some portal frames is deemed sufficient. We will talk about this in modeling later. And why local stability? Because negative moment and uplift, I said this. Also note, note the connection here. This connection here, first of all, you can see from the detail here that the purlin is not continuous. So you need to release it in both edges. Also notice the connection here is a pin connection. Those details are needed because those have consequences in robots. I usually like to talk about the meaning of what you do in robot and the consequences of your model on your real life. Also, also, uh, you might have a st stabilizing extra plate here because you have compression. You don't want to buckle your flange here, so you might need to stabilize your flange. With that being said, there are some preliminary design tables. Now, please notice that this is nice and dandy, but the presence of overpowered softwares like robot uh, or Autodesk robot is basically making those tables obsolete, but still, let's show it. So with that being said, 
uh, that is useful stuff in page 34 in the reference. And in table 8, it gives you like some good initial sizes that should work or be a good, ex a good guess uh, with regard to what you want uh, to be your final section. So fine, but I'm not going to show this because we have OP softwares. Now, about connections. For the EVES connection, you need a rigid connection. Once again, the bolts are perpendicular to the column. They go through the column, which means that they can develop tension and compression, which means this is a moment-resisting or rigid connection. Also, there is a compression stiffener because usually this will, the negative moment here, will apply a compression on the bottom, which will be transferred to the column as shear. You don't want to break your upper flange, and that's why you need stiffeners. But the eaves connection, the Hans shear, has similar sides to the beam rafter, is under axial shear and bending. The end plate is usually 25 millimeters, and the bolts used are M24 8.8 S275. This is Euro, Euro norms. What about the apex connection? The idea of having a Hans shear is not only to increase the stiffness of the beam, but also increase the ability of bolts to resist moments. Imagine I only have this place, only have the beam here without the haunch. Like if you have only this without the haunch, then you only have those bolts and the moment arm between those bolts is limited. So your moment resistance is very low. However, if you add haunches like this, then you can have more bolts with higher distance, which means your moment capacity increases. And that's the reason why we have haunches. Of course, here the haunch increases depth to satisfy connection bending strength. Same thing as rafter, end plate so-and-so, bolts so-and-so. Feel free to read this. Finally, the base plate. The base plate, and this is, this is one reference that lays my entire discussion to bed. Typically, they are pinned, and I can see a pinned base plate connection here. Of course, still, you need hold down bolts embedded into concrete, so that if you have tension, they can withstand the tension, and those hold down bolts are designed to withstand the tension. Now, the idea of pin versus fixed supports is a discussion that is ongoing, especially with our new subscribers, Engineer Sapai, Engineer Donald Khanie, and Engineer uh, Kandia. And uh, I think this is good reference here for you to try and understand that in this case, at least the reference here is assuming pinned for the base connections. This is kind of cool. I like that. Bracing connections, now here, I mean, you can just put any disappointing word you want, like, bruh, we know that, this is your gust plate, it's a bracing connection after all, so it's a truss connection, this is boring, this is stuff you learn from your uh, steel courses. Of course, feel free if you want me to dive deep into it, but I'm trying to focus on the new things. All right, trusses. Now, in trusses, here I want to give a disclaimer that trusses are less complex of a structure, and this is stuff you must have taken in your steel courses, I'm pretty sure that the project you took in your steel course was the design of a truss. So I will skim through this as fast as possible. You have multiple possible trusses. This is called W truss, and I want to roast this very quickly. The W truss has no vertical elements, which means that the diagonals will have higher loads. So keep that in mind. For truss members, T's are used for cords, which means double angles. Double angles also are used for cords, single angles for internal members, and, uh, I mean, if you want to have a meteor-proof warehouse, then you can use hot rod sections. Wait, what? Yeah, you can do that. I have not seen this. I have only seen hot rod sections in a truss in IKEA. It's kind of strange, to be honest. Truss members, well, I told you I'm going to skim through this. Uh, those are the connect those are like the cords, how they are arranged, how the connections are arranged. Feel free to skim through them. Or remember the stuff you learned in university. Nothing new in here. In typical annoying fashion, I wrote here that it needs bracing in both directions, which is going to be a challenge to do in softwares. Now, the good news is softwares have got so good in explaining to you when something is not balanced or is unstable, and we can keep trying until we stabilize our structure. Now, the, for the preliminary design and the connections, for the preliminary design of trusses, you should check out reference part 2, page 47 to, of 60. It tells you where or how you preliminary design your trusses. For example, a typical span ratio is 20, and tail member's inclination should be around 45 degrees. Uh, there is a warning about buckling and deflection. Also connections, this is trusses after all, so I'll skim through it. Uh, for simple beams, well, that's even less, uh, that's even less cool. 
because I mean I don't know if you still call it a portal frame or not to be honest uh, it's just a beam on column thing this is a pin you can see the bolt is not going through the column so it's most probably going to be a released connection and it's just a design of beam design of column nothing here to be meant to be explained here built up columns is kind of cool it's still a truss so I can still skim through it Sometimes it's not a truss, but usually it is a truss, and if it's a truss, why do you use it? You use it because sometimes you have a very high or large in height hanger, in which case your buckling length of the column is always going to be a problem, so you can increase the depth of the column without sacrificing weight, or I mean putting too much weight on it, by making trusses. So that's kind of cool. Claddings. Now, claddings... Uh, could be single skin, meaning that it's just one sheet of cladding. In this case, it's a trapezoidal cladding. You could have no insulation, and even if insulation is needed, you would apply it or hang it below the sheet. This is like having insulation below the sheet. Like, I mean, this looks cool and all, but after like two or three years, you will start having pieces of insulation in your ground because, I mean, it will fall down, right? But well, I think the reference says it's possible, so it's still ridiculous for me. If you want insulation, just go for the double skin configuration where you have insulation. It's still more complicated because now the two skins need to be spaced by spacers, but it's still worth if you have insulation requirements. All right, claddings for walls. I mean, for walls, you either have a brick wall or you have a cladding like this, or you could have an even fancier like you could have single skin, double skin, like we discussed before. Or you can even have a fancier cladding that is fire resistance with slotted holes for expansion and so on. Well, I think this is worth reading and discussing. Finally, for the estimation of member sizes, this is basically a very quick rundown of what you should expect of stuff being applied on the portal frame. And please notice that the reference is using the euro code as a reference for anybody who's a fan of those euro codes. Still, it's UK, so I think it will still use the national annexes and codes of the UK, but uh, those is just a small little abstract of whatever we have seen today. And well, that's everything I wanted to talk about. I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. If you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment, and subscribe, especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we will catch you in the next video.